okay, picture this. You're on stage or whatever finish line you have set for your current goal, whatever that happens to be. If it's the beach, in a photo studio, whatever. You look at yourself and you think, damn, I made it. Except for, you know, mm, except for what exactly? Like what did you not bring because there was something missing out of your cut? What little sauce did you leave on the table that you think, mm, if only I would have done that? That's what we're gonna talk about today. How you can avoid being in that position so that you bring your very best. How can you make your prep as effective as it can possibly be? So there's that on the table today and plenty more. This is The Drop Set, episode 249. Let's get to it. What's up, everybody? I am Darren Starr, uh, fivestarphysique.com, full-time contest prep and body transformation coach. Thank you for joining me here in my little humble abode. This is The Drop Set, episode 249. This podcast has been going on since 2016. This is a gossip-free and bro-science-free zone. We're here to bring the facts, just the facts, ma'am, and that's it. So uh, we have a few things that we want to discuss today, and check this out. For those of you watching on YouTube, hi. Hi. Thanks for being here. And for those listening uh, in podcast audio only land, hello to you as well. And a tip of the hat to you, although you'll have to imagine it. Um, check this out. So for those on YouTube right here, you're going to see this pop up. Ta-da. We have, lo and behold, hold on, full screen. Look at that. We have an outline. So you can kind of see what we're doing here. Do you need this in order to enjoy this episode? Absolutely not. This is really more for me than anybody else. It is March 22nd, 2024. It will be tomorrow. I'm recording this a day early. Also, uh, just because I want you guys to know how much I care. This is my second time recording this episode because the first time the audio was all screwed. So, and I'm like, I'm not going to post that. I can't do that. It's too bad. It's just too too hard to listen to. It was like I, I wrestled with it for a second. Like, is that good? No, it's not good enough. So we're going to talk about what the F is up with calves. Why can't they grow? Why do your calves suck, Jim, in Cleveland? I know you're watching or listening. Why do your calves suck? We're going to talk about them and figure out, like, are they different from other muscle groups? Do we need to treat them differently? And if so, how and why? Um are you maybe just not cut out for bodybuilding? This is a subject that came up um, with a client check-in this week, actually. I'm not going to get into details on what that was, but it uh, it's something that has come up um, a few times in the past where someone just thinks like, yeah, I don't, just don't think this is for me. And the question is, is that true or is there more to it? And do we need to dig in a little bit deeper? And I'm also going to, we're going to talk about the next, uh, the top five things that you can be doing and may not be doing to help you win your next cut. And by winning the cut, I mean having a more effective time coming in sharper next time than you did last time. So we're going to start exactly with that. So what makes for a successful cut? This is the big question. And the first thing I want to differentiate here is whether it's contest prep or you're a, what I would say, like a body transformation person, the process and the highlights um, are exactly the same. Nothing changes except for one key thing, which is uh, the duration of it, realistically. But you can't half-ass it. A lot of people say, well, you know, I'm not looking to do a show, so I don't feel like I need to do X, Y, Z, to which I say, shut up. No, that's not correct. Um, <laughs> like, you still need to be every bit as disciplined as somebody who is doing a show. You just aren't going to do it for as long. We're not going to try to get you to 5% body fat. We're going to be happy with 10 but you're not going to get to 10 if you pull so many punches early in the game. You'll never get there. It still takes the same amount of work, the same amount of dedication, just not quite for such an extended period of time. That's the only difference. You got to expect out what you put in. And if you're not putting in enough, it doesn't matter what your goal is. You're not going to hit it. So you, I always say when you're in a deficit, throw everything you've got into it. Be as precise on your plan as you possibly can. Contest prep is usually just longer, which therefore does make it harder. You know, when you're digging for those last couple percent body fat, when that last percentage you're digging for is five or six versus 10 or 11, it's a lot harder. And that's one of the big reasons why a lot of people don't want to do shows. And that's fine. Um, it's hard to dig for that. So um, the keys, let's dig in here. Hold on just a second. There we go. Um, 
start early. This is number one. Um, this is math, and I'm sorry about that, but it's very basic math. So if you can count your fingers and you can like count up to 10 or 20 or so, you got fingers and toes, then you're going to be good. It's that kind of math. It's not integral calculus or anything like that. So, um, so I would generally say however long you think, if you have some idea of how long you think it's going to take you to cut and be ready for whatever, add four weeks to that, and that's a good starting point. Um, you want to give yourself time for a little margin of error right? Um, you need to give yourself a little bit of room to breathe. You need to assume maybe that you're going to have some issues. There's going to be some times where you're not perfectly on plan. We hope that's not the case, but it may be. Um, you may need a deload at some point. Um, you may have plateau weeks that you need to bust through. Um, I think that whatever people have in their minds as being like, I think it's going to take me this long. First of all, that could just be wrong and due to lack of experience. I see that a lot. But also, if it's correct, that's also the best case scenario. And we want to plan for something closer to a worst case scenario, I think. More experience here helps because I said there's math involved. It helps if you know what your, what your target weight is going to be. Um, if it's somebody's first show, I typically don't know. Um, and a lot of people say like, oh, well, if you're going to do bikini and you're 5'2", you need to be 105 to 110 pounds on stage, which is just laughably dumb. Like, yeah, that might work for some people, but that's hardly universal. And some people might need to get into the 90s and some people might look good at 116 at the same height. Like all of those things are possible. Depends on how much muscle you have, depends on how much body fat you have left and how you carry it. Um, it's very individual. So just chasing a raw number that is a guess based on some kind of actuarial table, like, yes, if you're this height, you should be weighing this much is stupid, unless you're classic physique, in which case you have a weight cap and you have to be under a certain number, in which case, yeah, you kind of have to force it there. Um, but typically, no. So if you've never been stage lean, you don't really have a good idea of what your weight is going to be when you're down there until you're down there. And then once you get on stage, then you'd be like, okay, I was 165 on stage. I probably should have been seven pounds leaner. Note to self, we need to target 158 next time. Okay, cool. And now you know. So more experience helps. Um, I will generally have a reasonable idea within a handful of pounds of where I think somebody would be looking pretty reasonable on stage. Even that's a guess if it's the first time around. Um, you know, one of my clients right now, Josh, he's, he's just starting prep in a week or two for... I don't know, is this going to be our seventh show together, something like that? Like at this point, like I know what is, I know what his stage weight needs to be. So that it makes it a lot easier to know when we need to start prep. I also know he's a guy who is a hundred percent on point every single day and it's just never a concern. And so his body is t tends to be pretty predictable and responds very consistently. So it makes for a much easier prep that way. Um, having the experience of gone, going through the process a bunch of times helps for me. Um, I'm in prep right now. I'm uh, almost 11 weeks out. The last show I did was 2021. It's now 2024. That was two and a half years ago at this point. So does that 2021 experience, is that really relevant for this prep? Well, we can inform some things, but a lot's changed then. Like I spent two years in a growth phase and like the weight cap for my class changed as well. So, um, so I am targeting a weight cap now of 209. I may need to get leaner than that, but I at least need to be 209 or at most need to be 209 just to be able to compete and get on stage. So I may find that I need to be a little bit leaner than that, but you know, it's been a couple years. I think it's probably pretty close to that, but time will tell. Um, Next up, leave cheat meals out of the equation. Here's the, the dirty secret that nobody wants to hear. You do not need a fucking cheat meal. You just absolutely don't. Um, and by need, I mean there is never a physiological need for a cheat meal in order to keep progress going. A lot of people have this misconceptual, misconceived notion in their head where it's like, my metabolism's stuck. I need a cheat meal to rev it up. That's not how the body works, bud. Sorry. It would be nice if it did, right? Like, oh, I eat a burger and that's the solution for everything. Not how it works. Not how it works. Um, quite the opposite, in fact. So that is the very pinnacle of the mountain of wishful thinking. God, I wish that was the case. Man, bodybuilding would be way easier. Take it from me. I did a burger cheat meal pretty much every week of my last prep. And boy, I sure looked like it on stage, too. Like it wasn't good. Here's, here's what happens when, when, when you do this. Um, it, it is very easy to undo much or all of your entire week's deficit in one meal. Like my, my stock cheat meal was 3,800 calories. And so in order to then still be at a deficit and drop weight, which I did, my programmed intake had to just tank. It just had to be like in the shitter. Like carbs were low, fats were low, protein was high, but everything else was low. It sucked. And so by the time that cheat meal came around, I'm like, oh my God, I just need this to survive. 
there's that word again, need. I didn't need it. I wanted it. Um, but realistically, my intake was low enough. I probably did need something. What I needed to do was stop doing that because when you're not trying to outpace your binge eating cheat meal by dropping your calories to nothing, if you just remove that from the equation, you can raise your daily intake up and then be in a position where it's like, oh yeah, I don't need a cheat meal to survive because I'm not eating like an idiot for one meal a week, which then forces me to starve myself for the rest of the week. So um, things you learn when you coach yourself. Um but you don't need one. Um, you know, opt for something that's like a macro match meal out instead. If you're going to do something that's not, you know, explicitly on plan, this is what I did three weeks ago for my birthday. Uh, we went to Outback, had a steak, potato salad. That was in place of meal five. Meal five is one of my largest meals of the day, so I have some carbs and fats there to play around with. Um, I didn't run the math on it, but I could tell, like, yeah, it's probably about the same. And for a birthday when I'm 14 weeks out, I was okay with being like, yeah, well, that's going to be one my one meal for the entirety of a 20 two week prep that's off script probably. So I was comfortable with that. I was like, yeah, it's close enough. I didn't go nuts. I didn't do apps. I didn't do a dessert. I didn't have anything to drink that had calories in it. So, um, I felt pretty comfortable with that and I'm pretty much a stickler for always being on plan. But even that I'm like, yeah, it's my birthday. So, you know, at this point, every birthday feels like an achievement. So I feel like it needs to be celebrated in some way. Uh, Number three, manage your deficit intelligently. So what we're looking at here is, you know, there go there's going to be a point at every prep where you stop dropping body fat because your body has adapted to the program and the routine that you're throwing at it. And so at that point, you need to increase the deficit somehow, either by increasing your expenditure or decreasing your intake. So whichever one of those you do, it doesn't really matter. Um, and it can be a combination of the two as well. Rather than being, being like, I'm going to do a hard calorie drop, you could say, well, I'm going to do a little bit of a calorie drop, but I'm also just going to increase my output, like my step count, add in you know, an extra 30 minutes of cardio spread throughout the week, something like that. Like That gets the job done just as well. Think about if you're more comfortable being low on intake or if you have the schedule to support it, if it's easier for you to work in additional cardio. That's step one. If it comes down to we need to drop macros, okay, cool. Well, when are they coming from? And this is where the phrase, know your body becomes very important. And that's a very ambiguous thing when somebody says, you really need to know your body, be in tune with your body. What the fuck does that mean exactly? Well, in this case, it's pretty simple. Know your strengths and know your weaknesses. So um, for me, you know, I have five meals throughout the day. Um, there are stretches throughout the day where if I'm late for a meal, like I know it. And there are stretches throughout the day. This is where I, I'm kind of weird. Like post-workout, if I'm late eating my post-workout meal or just it's time to eat, I'm not particularly hungry. Like I'll eat it, but that's not a time when, you know, it's 11 o'clock in the morning. My appetite is not spiked. I think my body is still kind of in recovery mode, processing the workout and the cardio that I just finished and trying to figure out what the fuck just happened. Um, but I'm just, I just don't have a super strong appetite. Like I will eat anything, but my stomach isn't talking to me and telling me and reminding me to eat. Um, Four o'clock uh, is when I have meal four. That's just a protein shake right now. It's very uh, unsatisfying. It's just, a, you know, a meal's probably going to change fairly soon. I might swap that out for like a chicken veg meal or something like that just to have something a little bit more substantial. Right now, it's very underwhelming. I'm like, yeah, okay. But also, like, I'm doing enough stuff around four o'clock. It's like, yeah, whatever. This is, it, that's, I almost have to, like, it's a pain in the ass to interrupt what I'm doing and go make that shake and then chug it down. And then, okay, where was I again? Get back to, get back to work. Um, for me, my weaknesses, like I, I always keep a larger meal five, a final meal around eight o'clock. Um, that's dinner. Um, I always keep that meal on the larger side of things because I get really snacky, hungry, hangry, bitchy at night. And so if I keep that meal larger, um, that is much more satisfying to me. It's also kind of my pre pre workout meal. Um, since I have that go to bed, wake up, have my pre workout meal and then hit the gym. So the carbs are well spent there. It's a higher volume meal. Um, and it just, it works because I know like how my appetite swings throughout the day and towards bed. If I have like a very small, like if I swap those two meals around, I had a big meal at four o'clock and then just a shake at eight o'clock, that would suck. Would, I'm like, I'm going to be, okay, it's eight o'clock. Great. I'm done with my shake. It's eight Oh two. What else? And I'm going to go back in the kitchen and start looking for shit. And it's just going to get ugly real quick. So, um, so I do worry a little bit, like at some point my carbs are going to have to come down enough to where they're going to impact that final meal. And I'm just, uh, holding on to hope, knock on wood, et cetera, that by the time that comes around, I'll be ready for it right now. I don't think I would be, but we'll see.
we'll see. So think about when and where your macros get taken from uh, during the day. That's pretty important. Also think sustainability versus how much time you have left. Um, so uh, if you tank your macros down and you're starving and you've got 13 weeks left to go, not a good sign. Um, what you might want to do then, this would be a great time to think about implementing a refeed, but a refeed, not like a single meal or one day of high carbs. Realistically, you would need five to seven days of higher intake closer to maintenance. And then that can actually kind of reset the metabolism, help your thyroid reset, and then you can continue on. This is where it goes back to point number one, start early. So you have time for that if you need it. And that will avoid you from having to drop into like, okay, great. Now I'm eating 900 calories a day, which sometimes can be necessary necessary. Um, but if you give yourself enough time, you can usually plan your way around such extreme shitty options. So <laughs> I hope so. Next up, collect good quality data. Um, and so by this, what's good, what's quality, what's, what's data that doesn't lie to us? Well, the scale doesn't lie to us. Scale weights are always reliable, assuming your scale doesn't need to have a new battery put in it or anything like that. So, um, I know a lot of people don't like to get on the scale. They don't like to step on it. And to those people, I say very kindly, please get over it. Um, whatever emotional attachment you have to the number, let's work on flushing that out of your brain and just see it for what it is, which is an objective piece of data that just tells you, uh, you know, your body's relationship to, uh, the gravitational force pulling on it from the center of the earth. That's all it is. So, uh, it's just mass times the acceleration of gravity is how much you weigh. So, um, and here's the thing, like on a prep changes in body mass, change in weight, um, should be, it's not going to be linear, but it's usually pretty predictable and it's usually a pretty decent indicator of what's going on. Not always, but it certainly can be. Um, but a consideration here is that the greater your daily consistency, the greater utility of those numbers. So if, uh, for example, I wake up at the same time every day. I have meal one at the same time every day. I go to the gym at 8.30. I'm done with my cardio by 10.45. I'm home by 11. I do email and catch up. I'm having my post-workout meal at 11.15. Um, and then 2 o'clock, it's time for meal 3. And then 4.30, it's time for meal 4. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, this, that, the other thing. In bed by 9.45. Every day is the same. When every day is the same and all those variables are controlled, your weigh-ins get a lot more predictable and it's a lot easier to kind of read into them and figure out what they're telling you. If you're waking up at different times, your meal times are all over the place, your meal composition is different every day, you train in the morning some days, evening some days, the usefulness of those numbers goes way down in a hurry. And so suddenly it takes you a lot more time to kind of see and develop the trends that they're trying to tell you. Um, so what it allows us to do is have a shorter turnaround time for making decisions the more consistent you are. So the more clean and high quality those data points are, the better off we're gonna be, the faster we can make decisions. What's less reliable data? Circumference measurements, I'm not a big fan of if I can't take them myself, just because there is a little bit of skill that goes into taking good consistent measurements at the same place, pulling the tape with the same level of tension um, week after week, uh, for sure. Um, Bioimpedance scale, anything, anything that's going to tell you body fat percentage, muscle percentage, water percentage. The best thing to do with those numbers is to um, open up a, a notebook, carefully write them on a piece of paper, rip the piece of paper out of the notebook, and light it on fire uh, because it's not useful. Um, in body, bod pod, DEXA scan, they are all similarly unreliable. No matter how much people want to tell you that DEXA scans are the most accurate thing in the world, they might be, but they're not accurate enough. They're more accurate than the other methods, but they're still not accurate enough to make decisions based on. I have seen ridiculous errors on DEXA scans over the years, so I don't trust those at all. I don't ask my clients to take them. Um, they will often ask, hey, should I get these? And I will say, no, please don't waste your time or money. It's not worth it. I'm not going to use the data. So it's just not reliable enough for us to use um, for decision-making purposes. Fifth point is I want you to focus on performance. Um, and this means specifically training performance in the gym. If this is not going well, you're going to have a problem. So um, if performance suffers, your chances of losing lean tissue while you're in a deficit are greater, which, as is noted parenthetically here, is a bad thing. Um, I have been this person before. I have gotten up on stage having not had a good workout in six or eight weeks. And let me tell you, you can tell on stage, it's not a good look. Um, so 
if you focus on performance, and this means a few things here. First of all, be mindful of your overall fatigue. Be mindful of your rest and recovery. Take your days off. Modulate your volume downwards on prep. And that is not the time to be throwing in more drop sets, more rest pause sets, You know, doing stuff that wears you out more, that doesn't really provide that much additional stimulus. You don't need it. You don't need stuff that wears you out more. Just the act of being in prep wears you out. So um, throwing in more things on top of that, like you're adding lighter fluid to a fire that's already raging. Like, chill out. What are you trying to do? Like, burn the whole building down? Like, no, stop. Um, it's just not useful. So uh, you need to make sure that you are still performing at a high level. Um, and uh, if you're not, you probably have too much of a deficit. You might need to back off a little bit, look at your rate of loss. And it, it could be also, there could be a situation where your rate of loss isn't good. It's very slow, um, but your performance is still dropping. So we have issues here, like the deficit is not high enough for fat loss, but it's also too great to perform well. This is a problem. And this often goes back to point number one, give yourself more time to prep. Um, because most the most often scenario where I see this happen is if somebody has to tank their calories aggressively right at the start. Um, their body just isn't really ready for it. Maybe they don't really have enough muscle on their frame. Um, things are slow. Their performance is terrible and they still have 15 weeks to go. Bad combination. So and that's somebody who might need 24 weeks to prep. They might need a longer, more productive off season as well. Um, things that you can do, you can scale back your cardio. You can increase your calories and do a refeed. Again, we're talking like the five to seven day refeed, not a one day refeed. Cause what we're trying to do there is manipulate your thyroid levels. And one day of increased intake has been shown in studies to not really have much of an impact on that. A longer, um, refeed at maintenance levels or something close to it of four to seven ish days, something in that range is going to have more of an impact. I would try to make it a full week if you possibly can for sure. Um, and this also re relates back to point number one, just not giving yourself enough time like we talked about before. So let's, uh, let's go. We got some bonus points here, some additional things. There's four points here. Number one, don't be a fucking hermit on prep. Just don't do it. D I mean, Clearly, like, I have some very hermetic tendencies, her hermetic tendencies. I don't know what the word is. Making it up. Um, like, I like to be at home as much as possible all the time. Like, I don't like to go out. But when I'm in prep, I like to go out even less. But I have a wife. She likes to do some stuff. And so I don't want to say no to her all the time. I don't think that's fair to her. I also don't need to. What that does, that's me being selfish and saying, like, I want to make this easier for myself. Whereas you can just say, well, you know, we're going to do this. It's going to be a little bit harder, but we're, we're okay with that. You know, we can make this work. So um, don't be a hermit. But also accept that if you go out and engage in something social, it is increasing your degree of difficulty a little bit. And that can be okay. You know, it still just comes down to discipline. Body's all about di bodybuilding is all about discipline and willpower anyway. So um, don't be afraid to do the work. Don't be afraid to embrace a challenge. And that's okay. Won't be the last time you hear that. Um, and for the love of God, don't be a martyr about your diet in prep. Because I guarantee you, no one gives a shit at all except you the only reason you would do this is to try and feel better about yourself or make people feel sorry for you and i promise you they don't um unless it's your mom in which case she might um but otherwise nobody does <laughs> so uh the woe is me act my diet's so hard i'm so tired well of course it is you're also doing this voluntarily right so um it's kind of like saying my hand hurts from repeatedly slamming it in the car door well why don't you just stop doing that well you know i just told myself i was just going to keep doing this so you know, prep is like that, except there's a purpose to it, right? Like we're doing it to achieve a goal. So focus on the goal. Don't focus on how hard it is. Everybody knows it's hard. That's why most people don't do it. You knew it was hard before you started. So um, suck it up. <laughs> suck it up, buttercup. Absolutely. Um, don't be a prep martyr. I can guarantee you nobody cares. Um, embrace the challenge. This is like, we know it's hard, right? So make that part of what makes it fun. Um like just enjoy the fact that you're doing something, whether you do it at a, a high level or you just complete it start to finish, you're doing something that most people will not even attempt. And you're going to do it with some degree of success. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. So embrace that challenge. Just give it a big old bear hug and run with it. Some days are absolutely going to suck ass. 
Just know that going into it. If you've done it before, you know that. Most days will not. Most days are not necessarily going to be a walk in the park, but most days will not suck ass through a straw. Some will, and just be ready for that. And again, kind of embrace those. Often those days that really suck are the ones that are the most productive in terms of like where you're going to end up overall. And then finally, this is really like the most important one. This is the biggest key um, to having a successful prep, but I stuck it as the last bonus point. You got to have fun. If you don't have fun and you're not enjoying the process, like why are you doing it? Like again, there will be days that aren't fun. Big picture, the whole thing should be though. So um, that that's the, I, if there's one thing that you take out of this entire section of this podcast, it would be make sure that your prep is fun. Like again, not nonstop start to finish. Every day is a blast, but zoom out, look at the whole thing. It should be a good rewarding experience. You should be learning about yourself. You should be seeing your body do things that it hasn't done before. It should be fun. So make sure you don't lose sight of that because that is really, really important. Quick time out here and thanks again for watching. So podcasting is fun for me, but coaching is how I actually make a living. (laughs) Being an online coach has been my exclusive full-time gig for coming up on 15 years now. Hard to believe that. If you're looking for a coach, either for competition prep or just to get in the best shape of your life, you can check out 5starphysique.com and click on coaching for details on the programs that I offer. Quick version here. I get a ton of information up front to create a starting plan, and then we check in weekly to adjust that as we go based on your specific goal and the timeline involved. There's loads of detail up on the website, so I'll keep this short. Just check out 5starphysique.com for details. The link is in the description below. I do take on a limited number of clients and want to have a little bit of back and forth before starting up just to make sure that we're a good fit. So check out the website, read up, and hit the contact button to reach out to me directly. Okay, back to it. All right, onward and upward we go. If you're uh, enjoying this and you're on YouTube, feel free to uh, like the video, leave a comment, subscribe to the channel if you feel like I've earned that. Thank you very much. And if you are listening on uh, audio versions, thanks again. If you have the ability on your platform to leave a rating and or a review, like on iTunes specifically, that would be tremendously helpful. Nothing um, helps this podcast reach a broader audience than that, other than sharing these episodes on social media as well and tagging me on uh, Instagram at Darren underscore star would greatly appreciate that, of course, as well. Um, so uh, this segment here is bodybuilding, maybe not for you. As I alluded to in the intro, um, you know, this came from a conversation with a client. I won't get into the details there. It's not really relevant just because this is something that comes up periodically. You know, last year I had a guy who at six weeks out decided that he was quitting bodybuilding completely. He just didn't want to do it anymore. He wasn't enjoying it. And There you go. Okay. All right. Um, I've had people who have quit for religious reasons. Um, They have quit because they felt it was forcing them to be too selfish. Um, You know, some of those are things that as a coach, I can try and offer a little perspective on and maybe push back just because quitting is such a a term with so much finality to it. And I hate it. And as a coach, I will also say like my pet peeve is anybody quitting anything. Like it just chaps my hide. I can't stand it. Or when people put off, like, I just don't think this is the right time to which I say like, yeah, you're always going to find a reason to say that make it the right time. Like, you know, if it's important to you, if it was important to you a handful of weeks ago or months ago, it's still important probably. So, um, just quitting in general is something that as a coach, I just, it's, uh, I'm, I'm kind of allergic to it. <laughs> just, it doesn't work for me. So I'm always going to try and talk people through it unless it's something like, you know, my family is complaining about this, you know, or I've currently adopted this religion and it goes against, you know, whatever. You know, like, I, I can't argue with that. Okay, cool. Do your thing. So, um, but I do think that if you're going to pull the plug and quote unquote quit, like it's good to have, um, a, a, a broad picture and spectrum of knowledge and experience so that you can really know. And we'll get to that momentarily. So how do you know if bodybuilding might be for you? Um, well, first of all, who, who is it really for? This is the short definition and it's three things. The first one is it's for people who want to see their body change. If that's you, Hey, great. This might be for you. But along with that, you really have to enjoy lifting. And if you want to see your body change and you don't enjoy lifting, guess what? This isn't for you. This is not going to work because you might do it for a little bit, but it's only a matter of time before you get sick of it corollary to that, you might learn to enjoy lifting. So, you know, it's kind of like they say, like beer is an acquired taste. You got a lot of people that just don't like beer and then they drink enough and they're like, yeah, okay, I like this. And then they're like, oh, I can't get enough. I'm an alcoholic. Oh no, shit. 
So the same kind of thing can happen with lifting. You might not like it at first, but as you get better at it, I mean, you know, if you're brand new to it, how many people like things that they're brand new at and are terrible at? You got to stick with it and have some practice. So if you spent some time in the gym, you feel like you know what you're doing and you know you don't like it, this is not for you. Like, uh, like this requires a long-term investment. And if you're forcing yourself long-term to do something you don't want to do, first of all, you probably won't do it long-term. And it's also going to be exceedingly temporary because as soon as you hit your goal, you're going to stop doing it. And then everything that you've uh, earned will go away. So third category is people who are okay with hard work. So this is separate from the lifting component here because, you know, we have to be okay with lifting. We have to enjoy that, but also hard work, like discipline, sacrifice, et cetera. People who will climb a mountain because it is there, not because they want to get to the top, but just for the experience of climbing it because they enjoy that challenge. Those are people who make for, for good, uh, bodybuilders and people who I think are, you know, it's kind of like the litmus test. Like these are the people that are going to be successful with it, I think. Um, so if that's you, you're in the club, but competitive bodybuilding, how is that different? Because bodybuilding, the way that I define it, and you've probably heard this on the podcast before is, um, the, the act of following a plan to change your body. Competitive bodybuilding is getting up on stage and being judged based on how effectively you've done that. Non-competitive bodybuilding, or what I would call body transformation, like if you go to my website and click on coaching, there's a subset, contest prep, body transformation. As you might have guessed from the first segment, those two things are basically the same in how I approach them. They're just different in like, you know, if you're competing, there's other stuff to worry about. So exactly um, how is it different? And maybe competitive bodybuilding isn't for you. So what are the things that are, are involved here? Well, obviously, um, it's getting on stage and being judged, which for some people is just a complete and total non-starter. And I get that. I mean, you know, it's, it's a... I've said before, um, if aliens landed on Earth and the first place they went was to a bodybuilding show, they would be like, this planet is fucked. Let's leave. There's nothing we can do here. These people are just fucking bonkers. So it's a weird thing. Okay, you got to recognize that. And not all not all people want to do weird things. Some people just want to be a little bit more normal, and that's okay. So like, I fully accept and understand and agree with the assessment that this is some weird shit. So that's okay. Um, the spray tan is the thing. Like Everybody who has ever competed and talked to somebody who hasn't competed, this is always the first thing that comes up. And it's really like the smallest thing. It's like, who cares? You know, It washes off in a day. It just doesn't really matter. Um, it does have the, the absolute requirement of dedication. Also, if you're doing, um, a more, uh, I would say like informal body transformation, again, we still take that seriously, but if you have an off week or you take a vacation or something like that, we can extend your deadline. That's cool. If you're competing, the show date doesn't change, you know, it's locked in. So, uh, if you're off, it just means you're going to end up looking worse on stage uh, if you miss time or anything like that. So that's another, another thing that is different there. So um, this applies both uh, to both categories, but certainly I think probably a little bit more for competitors is the need for intelligent long-term planning. So you've got to think about um, how, uh, how you go about planning a calendar year, things like that. Another difference is are just the extremes that it's taken to. And so the first thing that people think of here are PEDs, but I've worked with plenty of body transformation clients who use PEDs. Like it's not something that is exclusively the land of the competitor. Um, it's for anybody who wants to go the enhanced route, understands the risks and is still okay with it. Sometimes it's just the goals for your physique. Um, you know, people want to do that and that's fine. Not something that I push, um, but it is something that I work with, um, with people. So, um, the other thing would be like, you know, how far you push. Like, again, like we talked about in the first segment, getting to 10% body fat is one thing. Getting to 4 or 5% body fat is a whole other thing entirely. So that would be a difference. Like, you can't be stage lean as a guy if you're 10% body fat. It's just not going to work. So um, that'd be a starting point. Um, but it's not where you get up on stage if you're going to win a show. Um, and th this is big also, like, kind of related to that health, you know, hormonal damage. You know, a lot of women will say things like, I don't want to push too hard and damage my hormones, or I did push too hard and I did damage my hormones. This is all stuff that is um, very, very uh, transient and or fixable, unless it's taken to a, a real extreme by some really poor planning. Um, keep in mind, like damage my hormones is a very vague term that doesn't really mean anything. So what are we talking about specifically? Like, oh, my estrogen was tanked. Well, that's very common. 
Um, that's kind of something that estrogen just does during prep to some degree. And sometimes it does that to a degree where your cycle stops, which honestly can happen in any sport. Um, so anyone who's running a caloric deficit and is doing a lot of output can certainly experience that it's called exercise induced amenorrhea. And it's, it's incredibly common, um, among hardcore athletes. It's not a bodybuilding thing specifically. Um, and certainly there can be hormonal fluctuation that happens at the extreme ends of prep. Um, but also all of that stuff is fixable and will largely fix itself as long as you're not stupid about how you do things after the show. Like if you starve yourself, starve yourself, starve yourself, starve yourself, get to the show, binge like a mofo for two months afterwards. Like, yeah, your hormones are going to be fucked. Absolutely. Some of that you did to yourself. Um, so just having some self-control and being able to kind of like intelligently reverse out of something like that is good. You also have to have a coach that knows what they're doing. And so the litmus test that I have devised for this is to ask your coach, Hey, I think my estrogen might be dropping. Is that something that I should be worried about? And if your coach says, no, that's good. Fire that coach immediately. We've talked about this, uh, in an estrogen module in I think two or three episodes ago, um, like women, you want your estrogen at good, healthy levels. You do not want to take anything to drop it. Taking something to drop it during prep is dumb because it's already dropping on its own just by nature of being in prep. If a client asked me, my estrogen is dropping, is that something I should be worried about? I would say, I don't think you should be worried about it, but it's not good. It is something that is normal that happens during prep. However, depending on what you're experiencing, it might be good to order a lab of a high sensitivity estrogen test just to see where it is right now. Um, and if necessary, like we can back off for a week or so. This is another thing that a short term deload slash refeed can help address to some extent. Um, and uh, see if that helps things recover. Um, you want to try and maintain your cycle for as long as you can. And if your estrogen is tanked, that's one of the first things that will go as a result of that. Um, but also like estrogen is a fat loss hormone. Estrogen is great for muscle retention as well. It's great for organ protection. It's good for so many things. Like the, the, the coaches out there who want to just nuke your estrogen down to nothing don't understand what it's doing. They just equate estrogen with fat gain because there are things known as estrogenic fat deposit areas. And so therefore they equate estrogen fat deposits. We nuke the estrogen. We drop the fat deposits, not how it works. Wishful thinking that would be great, but no, it's kind of like, you know, the cheat meal doesn't fix everything. The easy solutions here are not the correct ones. <laughs> so, um, it, it, cause again, your estrogen is going to drop on prep anyway. So you know, a little bit of a tangent there, but I, I'll get off my soapbox. So how do we give bodybuilding a fair shake to know if it's right for you? Well, here's the biggest thing. Um, I see this so many times with uh, clients who hire me and they have a show picked out and we immediately jump into prep for a show. They do the show and then um, they don't keep up with their coaching program with me. And that's all their experience of bodybuilding. They're like, oh, I did the show. Cool. And then they move on. That's not bodybuilding. That's doing a show. So... That is one aspect of bodybuilding, but it's not all of it. What you really need to do is experience all of the phases that are common in a calendar year or years. And so again, the last show that I did was November of 2021. It is about to be June of 2024, and I have not done a show in between those two times. So this is two and a half years. Um, you know, I've spent most of that time in a growth phase in between those shows. So uh, that is a good way to spend your time in bodybuilding. Now, I'm taking a little bit of a longer break between shows than most competitors do, um, just because as we'll get to, like, I don't really like cutting all that much. Um, but I do it because it's a good way to kind of strip down and see what you've been working on building. Um, and for me, that's the reward of that. So, um, but also like most competitors do enjoy one phase or the other quite a bit less. So, um, you know, you get a lot of people who like, they can cut all day long, but growth like, oh, I don't want to see myself getting any softer. This is hard for me to watch. I can't do this. Oh, the scale's going up. Oh my God, my, my veins are disappearing. My cuts are going away. No, no, no. I'm like, yeah, that's supposed to happen. All of that stuff is supposed to be temporary. Just like if you gain weight, that's temporary too. All of this stuff is transient. All of it comes and goes. So, um, and then you find a lot of people who they, this would be me. They love to bulk growth season. Yes, yes, yes. Perma bulk all the way. And then it comes time to cut and it's like, eh, eh. like for me, I'll do it just because I don't do it twice a year. 
So uh, it's rare enough for me that by the time a cut comes around, I'm like, yeah, I'm ready for it. Okay, it's not my favorite. It is nice to see stuff happen. Like I'm consistent enough that I'm at this point here being 11 weeks and change out. I'm seeing a few, cha- I'm seeing some changes happen like every two to three days. There's something new that shows up. And that's cool. That's a fun process. The day to day I could do without, like right now as I record this podcast at 3.30 p.m. in the afternoon on Thursday. I've got an hour to go towards my next meal, which is just going to be the very unsatisfying protein shake. I ain't thrilled right now. Um, if I look back here, there they are. i got a pack of Oreos sitting on the shelf right there from when I had those back in my meal plan. They're still there. I haven't touched them in seven weeks or whatever, um, but they're still there. I know they're there. I know where they are. Oh, yeah. Trust me. Am I going to touch them? No. Do I want to? I want to do so many inappropriate things to those Oreos right now. I just want to touch them and fondle them and have them put a restraining order on me realistically, but I'm not going to because that would be inappropriate and I'm not going to do that. So, wow, I was just channeling my inner Mike Israel there. I did not mean to do that. Um, but most people are going to enjoy one phase more than the other for sure. Um, so it's important to plan your timing and the pace of these shows as well. And think about, what percentage of your time you want to spend in a deficit when, you know, the pressure's on and that nose to the grindstone mentality is really like super critical versus the off season where you can take a vacation, you can take a week off from the gym and let your diet lapse for a week. And it's not that big of a deal. You can't do that during prep if you want to not have it have a massive impact on your show. Um, But plan your vacations, plan your time out, more social time, et cetera. And then prep comes around, go into the figurative bunker. Don't hermit. But go into your bunker where you're like hyper-focused. Nothing's going to pull me off plan. I can still do some things, but nothing's going to pull me off plan. You got the blinders up. Everything's good. So um, for me, I think, you know, you need to give it a fair shake to really know. Like you need to go through a good proper off season. And maybe you find that you're like me where, you know, for every show that you do, you need two and a half years of off season. I mean, that's a long time, but, you know, the same token, yeah. Yeah. Um, it can be super productive. And that, those are the people that are going to make the most progress from one show to the next. Like my goal here is when I get up on stage in June, I will embarrass the version of me that was on stage in November of 2021. Just because it's been long enough, I should have made some great progress. I'm doing a much smarter prep now. And even though I'm prepping myself for this show, which is intimidating, um, like I know what to do. Doing it for yourself is hard. <laughs> and judging yourself and your own progress is hard. But I think um, you know the outcome should be way better. So I'm excited to see that. So give it a fair shake. Absolutely. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to punch you there. Give it a fair shake. Um, and experience it through all of its phases before you really have a good understanding of what bodybuilding actually is. And then you'll have an idea of whether or not it might be for you or not. Hey everybody, I hope you're enjoying this episode. Just wanted to take a quick time out to tell you about a promotion I have going on now for my workout programs at fivestarphysique.com. I have around 50 uh, programs available as of right now. These are comprehensive workout splits for all people, goals, and phases. You can search by volume, general difficulty level, even the number of supersets involved so you don't end up with something that you can't properly execute because your gym is just too damn busy when you go to train. All of these programs do include full video demonstration playlists for each day narrated by yours truly so you know exactly what to focus on and what to watch out for on every move. These are ideal for all skill levels. You can use the promo code DROPSET, one word, at checkout to save 10 bucks on your first program. Link is in the description below or check out 5starphysique.com and click on workout programs. Okay, let's get back to it. Okay, final segment today. And thanks for sticking around through, uh, through all of that stuff so far, man. Um, thank you all for listening, by the way. I really appreciate this. Um, this podcast is kind of a, uh, it's a passion project for me. It always has been, it's never made a a dime for me. (laughs) I just, I do it because I enjoy doing it. I like getting in front of the camera or behind the microphone and just yammering on and I get some good feedback from it. So I know that there are at least some people out there who enjoy it. So I always appreciate the feedback. Um, any uh, idea segments or anything that anybody has, please hit me up, uh, social media, Instagram, um, at Darren underscore star. That's D-A-R-I-N underscore star with two R's. And again, you can check it out, fivestarphysique.com for details on everything that I do. So will your calves always be small or not? Um, why do they suck? Why are there so many memes about calves versus every other body part? Why are they so notoriously difficult to grow? Well, let's, let's dig into the problem a little bit. Why calves suck? 
are they different from other muscle groups? Um, I would venture to say, uh, you know, well, it's a complicated answer. And so the way I couched this was yes and no. Um, no, they are not different in that they are, you know, biologically the same. They are, they consist of the same sarcomeres, muscle fibers, strands, bundles. They contract in a similar fashion, et cetera. Um, they are used a little differently, however, which is worth noting. Um, so you have to think of the standard usage pattern and the standard load that they're accustomed to working with. They're accustomed to moving my fat ass around all, you know, in the off season, 250 pounds of me for around 10,000 steps a day. So they get a lot of, you know, consistent work that's not terribly challenging, but they're stimulated all day long. Well, I mean, I do spend a good bit of time sitting, but also like, you know, a good bit of the day um, I'm on them and they're getting put through a range of motion. They're being asked to do some work, right? So um, think about what if you did 10,000 like really light bicep curls every day, okay? And then you go to the gym and you do three sets of higher weight bicep curls. Like what's that going to do? That's how we treat calves. We hit them with a few sets once, maybe twice a week. Is that going to do anything when they're used to logging like 10,000, 20,000 steps a day in some cases? Like think about the, the disparate load between those. Like you're moving so much more weight just walking around rather than just putting a concentrated blast of, a, you know, a better load through what might not be that much better of a range of motion. Like a, a regular step is not full range of motion. But if you watch people do calf raises in the gym, a lot of that isn't full range of motion either. So, um, Genetics are a factor here, but no more so than they are with other muscle groups. You'll find some people like, I have a tough time growing my quads, but yet there aren't a million memes about quads. So th there's some speculation here. This has not been researched, but my speculation is that the human population in general is bad at calf training. Um, for some reason, they are most commonly approached different than other muscle groups and different in a bad way. So they're just not getting a proper response to, to grow in the way that we might expect them to. Um, so do we need to treat them differently? If they aren't growing, then fuck yes, uh, clearly. Like you're doing something wrong. So <laughs> let's change something for sure. That's, that's, that's a no-brainer. That's a softball question. So thank you for that one. So the first thing we want to check here is form. How do people often do form wrong? Well, the first thing is they just go too heavy. So they think like, well, you know, I'm just I'm not pushing much weight for calves when I'm walking 10,000 steps. So I'm going to load the stack and I'm going to just rep out, you know, 10 or 15 reps here, whatever I can get. Um, the problem there is it turns into a lot of a joint exercise, hips, lower back. It turns into a trap exercise. You're shrugging the machine. Your range of motion still isn't good um, because you're just focused on moving too much weight. And corollary to that, you're going too fast. Um, you're bouncing. How many times have you seen somebody on the calf raise where they're just bouncing up and down? One, two, three, four, five, six. Like, it's not a race, dude. It's not about how quick you can get to 15. Like treat calves the same way you would treat any other muscle group if you were in, if you were training that muscle group intelligently. That's step one. Don't treat them differently until you discover that you need to. Um, but most people by default will train their calves differently. Now, to be clear, a lot of people will train other things this way too. Like I've seen plenty of rapid fire bicep curls. One, two, three, four, five, six. To be clear, like the people that are doing that have biceps that don't grow also. So, you know. That's not a recipe for success, no matter what you're doing. You need to think proprioception, mind-muscle connection. How much is the muscle activating as you're putting it through its full range of motion? How deep is that connection? Putting it through a good range of motion is, is not enough. Um, that's where they they get a little bit different. Um, so you want to feel the deepest contraction that you possibly can in the calf. So think of it this way. You're six years old. Your grandpa comes up to you. He's teasing you. He says, make a muscle. You go like this, ah, flex, right? Everybody knows what that is. Like a bicep is really easy to visualize. We think about it from a young age. We know what a flexed bicep looks like and feels like. Um, you know, you can very easily just squeeze it. And then you could be like, okay, well, let me squeeze that bicep harder. Like, okay, eh, yeah, there it is. All right, cool. Yeah, it got a little harder there to the touch. Okay, cool. Squeeze it harder still. Eh. Can you squeeze it hard enough that it feels like it's going to cramp up? Like, chances are, yeah, you probably can. That's proprioception. That's your ability to contract the muscle at varying rates of intensity. Can you do that with your calves? I can. Like, for, for all the uh, likelihood that calves cramp up on people, most people lack proprioception with calves. As I just sit here and flex them, like, yeah, it's a pretty deep contraction right there. Um, and we'll get to a secret weapon that I have for kind of forcing that to happen a little bit. Um, 
but yeah, if you want to get that deep, deep contraction um, on, on every rep when you do calves, the secret sauce is to think heel forward. A lot of people, when they do calf raises, we'll talk about standing calf raises here. They go up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. The, what I want you to think about doing, and this is going to be something that you visualize and think about more than what would actually see, is up and forward. Like lift the heel up and then push the heel forward, not by bending the knee or anything like that, not by like shifting more on the, on your toes from the ball of your foot, but just think about moving your heel forward, like push the weight just a little bit more on the ball of your foot, heel forward, heel forward. When you do that up at the top, when the calf is in the shortest position, you're really forcing the whole thing to contract. So that's where we get that deeper contraction from. And this will probably require you to back off on weight a little bit to get used to this sensation for sure. But that heel forward thing, that's my secret weapon. Um, I have pretty good calves. Um, it's kind of like triceps and forearms. Like, you know, my, my, my strong muscle groups are forearms, calves, and triceps. It's like, why can't it be back and legs? I don't know. It's just the cards I was dealt. So, um, so they have, they, they, my calves are good genetically, but they've also grown since then as well. And I don't throw a lot of volume at them. I just execute stuff as well as I possibly can. Um, so what kind of volume are we looking at in order to get calves to really respond? So if you've got great form and really high proprioception, moderate volume can work great. I'm the test case for that. So again, I have good calf genetics, like they were a decent size to start, but they have grown since then. And I don't do crazy volume with them. I will occasionally throw some extra at them, but it's not something that I do consistently. Um, with less great form, it doesn't matter how much you train them. Like fix the form first. I think that's a, a note that I have coming up here pretty quickly. Fix your form first and then aim for that three-day soreness. So you know like the first time you start a new training block and maybe you haven't trained calves for a little while, but they're written on the training block. So you go in and you're like, yeah, I'm going to crush some calves here. And then you can't walk for two and a half weeks. Like we don't want that, but you're going to experience that the first time for sure. But then you come back and second time, you know, after you take three weeks for them to recover, you come back, you hit them again, and they're sore for three days. That's what you want. That's what you want. That means if you can hit that consistently, that's how you know you're getting the level of contraction that you really want in order to get a growth response from them. If you're not getting that, then the connection needs to be worked on. We need more practice, back up on weight, heal up, try a variety of movements. Um, four hard sets, two to three times a week. That's pretty reasonable. It's eight to 12 sets per week. That's, you know, eight sets is what I would say the minimum effective volume is. 12 is right kind of in that sweet spot. That's pretty decent. Um, not too bad at all. And I would, I would use a variety of movements to get there. And you might say, that's great, Darren, but I'm a crazy motherfucker. What am I going to do? Well, if calves are your only real weakness, you still need to fix your goddamn form first um, because they're a weakness for a reason, and that's the first thing we need to address. So fix your form, absolutely. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. That's got to be the first thing. Then once your form is good, you're connecting with it, I would say like coast with that for a little bit and see if just fixing the form is enough to, to get them to grow. Um, and if they grow a little bit, but also like they feel like they still got some capacity in for more work, then we can try a little bit of additional volume. You can give them an entire day if you wanted to, that would be a little crazy, but you can do it if you want to. And you know, if you've got some, some strengths in your, in your physique, um, and you, you've got maybe some weaknesses, but calves are one of them. Maybe calves are the most glaring weakness. Maybe your men's physique and your legs are really good, but you got no calves. Like they're suddenly very important. So, um, I would, I would dedicate a lot of time towards them. Absolutely. A full day. That's a lot, but it's not, not the dumbest thing in the world. So, um, keep in mind, there's four variations for how you could do a calf exercise. This is a combination of flexed versus extended hips and knees. So we'll start with the most common one, extended hip, extended knee. This is a standing calf raise. So that's the staple movement there. Then you've got a flexed hip, extended knee. This would be a calf raise on a leg press or a donkey calf press. You've got a flexed hip and a flexed knee. This is a seated calf raise. And then you've got the extended hip and the flexed knee. Any guesses as to what that is? I'll give you a hint. There's no machine for it. Nobody ever does this movement. I don't know that I've ever done this movement, but having thought of this, I want to try it now. And so I will go to the gym and I will report back and let you know what I think. This would be like a calf raise in a bridge position. So you're on a bridge, you're on the floor, hips are on the floor, um, knees are bent, feet are flat on the floor. 
and you're going to put your feet on like a little step, like a four inch step or something like that. Put the balls of your feet up there and then just do calf raises from a bridge position like that. Honestly, I have no idea what that might feel like, but that is the fourth combination of how we could do a calf exercise. So I'm really kind of curious now. So mix up at least the other three. Um, like if you did five sets of each of those and they were all hard working sets, your calves are going to be devastated. So I would work up to that slowly. <laughs> um, but also like you do that regularly and you do it with good form, they're going to grow. They will. It's not genetics. It's not that your calves just suck. It's not that they're built differently and they just can't grow. It's that we need to fix your form. And then assuming the form is good, we're feeling that good connection. They get sore as shit. And I'm not talking superficial soreness. I'm talking that soreness that lasts three or four days. Um, if you get that, good. And then if they're still not growing, they're not getting enough volume. And at that point, throw the kitchen sink at them. Don't be afraid to give them a better part of a day. Like do it and, and treat them like you would anything else. Like you're doing a set of heavy bench press. You give yourself two minutes between sets. Give yourself two minutes between sets of calf raises. Work up to the point where you feel like you need that. And then we'll come back and talk. So that is all I got. Ha, we're done. We made it. Um, next episode is uh, 250. Um, I have I have no plans, no celebratory plans for episode 250. So it's just going to be a regular episode next week. I'm a little disappointed. Maybe uh, somebody maybe somebody will avail themselves to an interview between now and then, but kind of doubt it. So um, anyway, uh, again, if you're on YouTube, leave a comment. Um, any questions on anything we talked about here? Um, any uh, uh, ideas for future show segments? Anything like that? Awesome. All welcome. Like the video. Give me a subscribe if you feel like I've earned it here. Thank you. Um, and if you're listening online um, on any streaming platform, a rating and a review would be amazingly helpful. Share the episodes on social media at Darren underscore star on Instagram. Tag me, please. Thank you very much. And uh, I can't thank you all enough for listening. Truly. It means a lot to me um, that you join me here on a regular basis. So um, that's all I've got. So we'll be back here next week for 250. And if you've made it this far, as always, you're the real hero. Okay, that wraps up another episode, and thank you all so much for watching. If you like this episode, please share it on social media and tag me on Instagram. I am at Darren underscore star. Also, please subscribe to the channel here if you haven't already, and feel free to check out any of those other videos that you see here as well. 5starphysique.com has details on everything that I have to offer, including contest prep coaching, body transformation coaching, workout programs, swag, and a whole lot more. Thanks again for listening, and I will catch you all back here next week.